Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Web Podcast. I'm your host, Rob O'Sell. I'm a developer at this.labs. Today, we're going to be talking about investing in open source, and we have some awesome guests here today. So today, to discuss this, we have Moshe Millman, who's a co-founder and COO of Apply Tools. We have Eva Howe, who's operations manager at this.labs. And we have Chris Whitehead, who's a senior software developer and one of the apprentice mentor mentors at this.labs. Hey, everybody. How are y'all doing? Great. How are you? Good. Good. So to get us started on this conversation, <laughs> Eva, I know that this thought has a apprentice program that deals with open source, uh, which is you've been doing this year and it's really interesting. So I was wondering if you could introduce to us, what is this apprentice program? What does it have to do with open source? Yeah, happy to. So the apprentice program takes well, let's see, let me back up just a little bit. Um, we at the start are really interested in helping out junior developers and helping out women in specifically. Um, and what this open source program does is it takes a woman coming out of boot camp um, and it we are working with Apple Tools to um, take their uh, software and put it into open source repos. So the woman basically does this PR um, and we pay her to do it and she gets some experience. She gets those lovely green dots on GitHub. Um, and then we also have a mentor, we have mentor mentors. Chris is one of them who helps them with any blocks that they get on the coding side. And then I help them with the logistical side and just the emotional support of getting through it all. Awesome. And, you know, it's interesting that it's, you know, open source. What is it about open source software and the open source community that has kind of created an opportunity for, for you to do this program? Well, um, Apple Tools believes in open source a lot, as we do at the Start Labs too, and we want to give back to the community. And this is a way of giving back to the community and helping um, underrepresented folks get their foot in the door of being a software developer. So it seems like a win-win all around. Awesome. So Moshe, I mean, Eva was just saying that uh, Apple Tools has been such a useful partner in this program for dealing with this open source contributions. You know, I guess, before we go much further, do you want to introduce what Apple Tools actually is to start out with? Just so everybody that might not be familiar with it understands what, what it is that you all do? Yeah, for sure. Um, what we're trying to do is to make it like really easy to test your um, front end, your user interface in an automated fashion. So every time you make some changes to your CSS, to your uh, front end code, just uh, have an automated test that will validate it and immediately show you uh, how it affects the look and feel of your site on different browsers, different devices, different screen sizes, and make it like seamlessly integrated with your pipeline so you don't really have to worry about it. So either on the component level or on the page level. Um, and this, we've been working with a lot of companies and open source is obviously a really big part of um, UI development in general now. There's like tons of uh, very popular uh, open source libraries. Um, so we figured that if we can help some open source projects be able to test um, their, their, their projects in, like in, in this way. On one way, this will give us you know, like a great feedback about our, uh, our software, new features, new stuff that we had, see how people are using it, see how they uh, benefit from it. And uh, the other way also have it out there so people can see some you know, best practices for how to use it, for how to integrate it. And um, when Tracy introduced me to this um, idea of the apprentice program, it seems like, you know, like, uh, across the board, as Eva was saying, because, you know, you help some uh, women get into uh, tech and we're seeing how hard it is to find the uh, female engineers for our team. I mean, as much as we try to be um, uh, diverse, I mean, it's really, really hard to, uh, to find, um, uh, you know, female engineers with the, with the right skills. It's getting better, but it's still a challenge. And uh, uh, I think, you know, so this is kind of like a really good, uh, really good program. That's really awesome. You know, and I guess, it sounds like open source is really important to you guys, both just the community of it and also, I mean, all the different ways that you guys connect and integrate. I mean, a lot of the libraries that you guys are connecting with are themselves open source. I mean, what does, you know, you talked about it a bit, but like what does open source mean to Apple Tools? Both, obviously it's, it's strategically important for your, for your product, but then, you know, what does it mean just for the culture? Like why, you know, why does open source matter so much to you and your engineers? Yeah, so, so there, are a few, there are a few aspects around it. I mean, when we started the company, one of the things we were trying to think about is like, how can we make it 
really easy for people to start using it and to enjoy the benefits of uh, doing visual testing or doing automated testing in general. And we're looking at ways to seamlessly integrate into existing pipelines, existing approaches that uh, people are using. And for the most part, what people are using today for testing are libraries like Cypress and Selenium and Storybook and, um, um, and all these are open source and uh, there are some awesome people that are developing these tools in their free time and uh, investing a lot in uh, kind of like contributing to the community and making it um, so good and uh, cons you know, consistently support it and consistently improve it. Um, so this, I mean, this helps a lot to our success. I mean, the fact that these tools are so great and so many companies adopt it and it helps drive more value from our product. So. Uh, some of it was just kind of like wanting to um, uh, give back and kind of like show our, uh, like how we appreciate that. So uh, we're also actively contributing to some of these projects. We have some developers working purely on the uh, open source uh, contribution. And uh, I think you know, every opportunity we have to um, help some of these projects. And this is kind of like a small, um, a small thing just to add visual testing as, as part of their pipeline, but still, you know, that's like, an, I mean, if, if they can enjoy this benefit, it's kind of like a small, small thing that we can do. So I don't know if you've thought about it or any of you, uh, you know, Chris or Eva as well, but it's been a big topic of conversation in the development community, just how much so many companies rely on open source, right? It's this, it's basically this um, sort of unspoken about thing, just how much of the productivity of these companies is based on this, the labor of this open source community. And so there's been a lot of conversations about, you know, what is the responsibility of companies to give back and to support this community um, in all the various ways. So, you know, I guess that's my question is, what would be the argument, especially based on your all's experience here, you know, why should companies give back to open source? What value, should they understand that they get and, and what responsibility do you think that they have for using the software you know, to support back? What, what would be your pitch for that? So I was reading this the other day, uh, GitHub did GitHub Universal and they were announcing a bunch of new platforms and new products, things that they're doing. And they said that they are currently estimating that 99% of all software is built using open source technology, 99%. And because of this, they like realized, oh wow, like what we do, what we provide is so incredibly important that it cannot fail. So they literally built uh, a storage facility in I think Iceland or Norway or somewhere really, really cold in like an ice block that will last thousand, at least a thousand years where they stored all their code. And they did that because like, if 99% of the, of the software in the world is running on open source technology, it cannot fail, right? if these things fail, like what is the, what is the outcome of this? And so I think that was a really interesting thing of, you know, it started off um, as a conversation of, of a friend of mine is an electrician and he was talking about, you know, I was talking about open source and, and the open source community. And he was like, if we found a way uh, to lay pipe and, and wire 20% more efficient, we would tell no one. And I was like, we would show it to everyone literally immediately. And it is, and I think my point was that it's, we do not necessarily make you know, money or build software based off of, um, how do I say this? Like, if I contribute to Angular and I make the Angular project and that open source library better, I benefit from it too, even if other people do, because I make, you know, we do business based off of what we can do with these open source technologies. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting topic of conversation of, you know, if, if you're a business and you have the ability to say like, you know, we work with Angular or, you know, RxJS is a really good example or the Rx reactive library where Netflix came in and said, this is a concept that we want to do and we're now we're going to open source it. So that way others can also benefit from this. I think that like it is, there is an onus on, on companies who really rely on their primary business to be from these open source technologies to, to give back, right. Then grow the community. Like there's a reason you chose these things why would you not give back to grow it, right? Make, make it better, make the community better because you also see a benefit from this. Hear, hear. <laughs> uh, Moshe, did you have anything else to add? Like, I don't know, like if you've talked to other uh, business leaders or, you know, other owners of, of tech companies and talk to them about like, I don't know if any of them say to you, like, why do you bother? you know, contributing to that stuff or if you make pitches to them, like, is there anything that you say or think conversations that you hear around this when you're talking to other business leaders? Yeah, no, no, I did get a few questions about it and about, you know, like what's kind of like, what's in it for us in these uh, programs. And um, 
I think that the interesting kind of like shift that I'm seeing is like when we, I mean, when we launched the product, like the first version of the product to the market back in 2015, I think it was, um, um, we started going to some, you know, like Fortune 500 financial services companies and uh, they're like back then they were very conservative in how they're looking at open source. And some of these companies were even um, hesitating whether it's a good approach, it's, a, it's a safe to go with an open source project. I mean, who knows if it will be maintained for the long run, who knows what security vulnerabilities may be introduced. And there was like lots of these questions and some companies were actually, um, losing i think a lot of momentum and losing a lot of um, ability to compete because of the fact that they're like uh, kind of like trying to stay away from open source and trying to keep uh, open source technologies out but i think now everyone realizes even the most secure and the most strict um, um, companies out there and even government institutions are all now starting to uh, adopt and embrace open source and uh, many of them are also starting to understand the importance of also contributing back so it used to be a situation where you come to a company and they start using i don't know Selenium or Storybook or whatever, and they find an issue and they start complaining about it. And you know, like you know, now they understand they don't have to complain. You can actually, you can actually contribute. You can actually fix it. Um, and it's not like you know somebody's uh, making money out of this. Uh, you know, like uh, I know a lot of people from the Selenium team, and they're all you know spending their uh, their time on it. And it's not like they're making any immediate benefits out of it. So um, I mean, again, coming and complaining and saying that the documentation is not good or the, you know this new version has some issues. I mean, that's kind of like counterproductive. I think supporting the um, projects in any way you can. And, and I think more and more people start to realize that like, in order to support open source projects, you don't necessarily need to be a core uh, contributor or like you know, commit uh, code, but you can also contribute to the documentation. You can also contribute in many other ways. Uh, so it's nice to see this kind of like trend. And um, and again, I won't mention specific company names because I don't know what's the policy about like sharing this, but I'm seeing like really like, you know, top brands, top fortune, uh, 500 companies, but not, you know, like the Google and the Facebook, which, you know, have been doing it for a long time, but even like, you know, banks and uh, media companies and all have like engineers contributing to open source, doing their own open source projects and uh, opening a lot of the stuff that they're doing to the community. So I think it's just great to see how, um, how this kind of like uh, evolves. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny, right? Like in this, in this day and age, in this era of, of, of software development in corporations, like, I think a lot of people even forget what it's like to have to pay for office subscriptions. Like, you know, back, you know, nowadays everybody's using Google Docs or what have you, right? Like a lot of the um, recurring subscription costs of some of the software tools that people used to use and that some people continue to use um, would surprise some people that aren't actually paying those bills. Um, and I think one thing that would be great for companies to realize is that for a fraction of that amount, realistically, the goodwill you can engender for your company by just giving back to these open source libraries that you really rely on. Um, there's a lot of tools out there, the like open source collectives and or open collectives and uh, GitHub has ways to do this now. And there are a lot of really um, above board uh, ways that you can give money back to the open source community and, and it's structured so it can fit into the, the ways that you do donations and things like that. And I mean, the goodwill you can engender by just supporting this community, again, at fractions of what it might cost if you had to have proprietary software to do a lot of the same things. Um, I think people would be surprised what the value would be to just to make sure that the tools that they use all the time are there in a year from now, in two years from now, uh, because they're supporting the developers that are doing it. So I, I think that definitely that's the case is people should realize that at some point, uh, is not a guarantee that this will keep happening um, for free. And so the more we can support it now to keep that free going forward, or at least to keep it more open going forward, I think, you know, that's probably a positive for everyone. I, I think I totally agree. I think Marshall, you touched on this as well is I, it's, we, we're changing the complacency, right? Like when we're developers, we use, we use software to write tools and to solve problems and these kind of things. And, and so now like when, when you have a company that, promotes the contribution to giving back you're saying like we don't accept that this library that we're using that we know that we love that fits this business we don't just accept it, that it has these issues and those are unsolvable we're, we're not going to just like sit back and like okay well we'll just use a different tool or we'll you know try to work around it like we this this changes that conversation it changes how we interact and we can say we have the ability and the power and more than that maybe like it sh we should go in and solve it. We, go, we should go in and make these issues and make these contributions because we would benefit from it and other people probably will too. 
And, I, and I'm curious, I mean, I know that, you know, at this audit, it has been massive, but I'm curious too, Masha, of how your engineers have responded and, and maybe been more engaged. I've heard that as well. Of You know, it, it gives you something to do where like you as an engineer feel more engaged in your process, more engaged in your company because they support this concept of like, we believe in giving back, right? Uh, and I think that that's like a, a massive sell for this too, is not only do you get a benefit for a company, like Rob was saying of like, these tools are open source for a reason. They're free for a reason. And yet they're, they're incredibly, you know, they're powerful. They're running our businesses. They're making you money, like giving back, you know, monetarily and with developer time, not only do you support this thing that you built your business off of, but you, you're increasing your developer engagement too, because then they get to see like a direct value in these things that they're doing and saying like, I saw a change that I thought was necessary and it's no longer just a, hopefully they do that and say, I can make this happen. I have, I have that power, I have that ability to give back and provide it. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's actually a great point. And I think um, one of the things that people are sometimes overlooking is like, um, I mean, if you're committing code to some of these um, um, big open source projects, I mean, it's also very good for your personal brand. I mean, it helps you um, uh, promote yourself, put your name out there. And I'm seeing a lot of like, uh, one example, when we saw the, um, Selenium IDE project, which was kind of like a subset of the Selenium project uh, for record and playback for people that are got, just getting started with coding and can't really use Selenium. So they had this tool called Selenium IDE, which allow you to record and uh, uh, record your browser actions and create kind of like a script out of it and play it back or export it to Selenium code. And at some point, I think it was a couple of years ago, um, it was based on Firefox and uh, Firefox changed the security settings. So it got to a point where like the recording was no longer working because it was kind of like causing a security vulnerability. So we decided to pick it up and uh, help kind of like um, rewrite this project based on some modern technologies and uh, re-support it. So we had two uh, great engineers from our team that were, um, um, you know, working on that and building this and like bringing it back to life. And I think it was also excellent for their personal brands because, you know, they went and spoke about it in a lot of different conferences and now, you know, like everyone um, consider them as like kind of like a, a leaders in this space and appreciate their contribution. So I think it's, uh, I'm sure that they enjoy this experience and it helped kind of like promote their personal brand. And obviously, um, and for us, it's an opportunity to kind of like also contribute back a little bit. Awesome. I, yeah, so that's something that like when I'm, when I'm in a position to evaluate different solutions to use, one of the things I look at is how active, right? Um, Auth0 is a great example of this. They do a ton in the open source community. They do a ton with what they're doing in open source. And, and, and to me, like when I'm in the position to be, say like, hey, we have this problem, why don't we use this solution like Apply Tools? You know, and one of, the, one of the things that I look at, one of the things that we look at internally at this dot is um, how active are they? Like what support have they done? That, that is to me like a determining factor and it's an important one too. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I think one other thing too, when we're talking about sort of a last, uh, pitch for why other companies that might not be investing in open source or at least interested in it should do it is obviously the apprentice program. <laughs> there are people out there like Eva doing great things uh, for diversity and inclusion and all other sorts of causes uh, using that through the vessel of open source. So, you know, you can give back both to open source and to improve things in the community doing contributing to pr programs like uh, the open source apprentice program that Eva was talking about earlier. So, I mean, there's just a lot of positives here for companies. Um, if you're not investing, you know, if you have any amount of budget or any amount of interest in it, it's definitely something you should be looking at uh, going forward. So let's flip this a little bit on the coins. So that's why companies should be involved. I'm kind of curious from each of you, because all of you now working together in this program have represented kind of companies trying to invest in open source. And I'm curious when, in your experience without necessarily naming names, you know, what are some things that open source communities, open source libraries could be doing to make it easier to be invested in? Um, you know, because I'm sure there are certain things on some projects that have made it easier to integrate, either to integrate with or just to interact with the, the maintainers. So what are some of the things that open source libraries should be doing that just lowers the friction, makes it easier for companies to invest in them? I think one of the things that we have seen through the, through the apprentice program specifically, um, as we, so we work with a lot of, we work with Apple tools to help introduce it to a lot of open source repositories. And, um, one of the, one of the most 
the, the thing to me is like we're evaluating these different repos and you know I'm helping these women come in and and do that onboarding thing of like you know this is what we're going to do this is the process we're going to go about it one of the things that really sets apart an open source repository for me to be like yes I'm interested in 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 injecting into this and using this and uh, helping these ladies with it and then investing in it potentially is how easy are your docs to read right what are the what are the language of the docs of saying like if you want to contribute here's how right how wait it's like a level of gatekeeping when i when i can go through these docs and i can see like a giant section on we want your help we look for your contribution we appreciate your contribution check out our other contributors support these other contributors look at our issues the, the issues are very well defined they have good descriptions maybe they use like um, i think github has that uh, templating thing you can do of like when you're submitting an issue this is what we're looking for um but like a, a, a healthy contributing document of you know, these are the things we're going to look at if you want it. We want this to be successful and you want this to be successful. But, you know, we have to understand as engineers that, you know, that they're going to get a ton of these pull requests and not everything can get merged, right? Not everything fits. Not, and, but like, it's almost like, you know, interview when you're looking at resumes, you cut out ones that don't match what you're looking for. It's a very similar thing, right? Like be very clear and upfront if you're an open source repo that's looking for assistance, uh, be very clear that you are and be very clear in the, in the ways that that can be accomplished. Um, you know, make it very open and say, these are the things we're looking for. This is the template that we are looking for. These are the like non-standard things that we do. We, uh, we had some issues with that where it's like, we expect that you run this test suite and then it passes in this manner. We expect that you update these configuration things and they update in this manner. Um, and, and so that to me is, is massive uh, for if I'm, if I'm looking to invest in open source, whether that's through contribution or otherwise, is tell me how. Give me clear, um, clear rules and and regulations of how how I can do that, so that it were both beneficial. Yeah, I think by the way that's uh, that's exactly the point I was going to make. But I think it's just about making it really easy for someone who is interested to contribute uh, to the project to understand how to do it. And some projects are doing a great job, even like putting videos, just to kind of like showing how to become a committer and what are like you know, there is the obvious things that are kind of like the same across all projects, but there are some specific tools, specific uh, processes that specific uh, open source libraries are using. Uh, so the kind of like exposing people to what these are and uh, what are the expectations from a committer and what are the top priority things that they're looking to get um, contributions on. So I think th this can make a big difference. And um, some of these open source libraries, I mean, there are some libraries that are maintained uh, full time by employees of certain companies or so company, um, supports it. And most of the maintainers are from that, uh, from that company. So I think in the, context of the apprentice program and this is actually a great um, a great way to find <laughs> to find talent and to evaluate talent because you know if you have an apprentice that is involved in this project you can you as a maintainer of the project which may be you know again from a company you can see her in action for you know for a few weeks just doing this work and see her code see how you know quickly she turns around things and how nice the code looks like and so it's it's much better than any interview you would be able to do in any other in any other context and I mean, this project is like relatively, for the most part, it's relatively a small investment. So after this small investment, being able to see, you know, like three apprentices in action and you choose, you know, one or a few of them. I think this is like a big win for uh, for companies. And uh, Eva, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think few of the apprentices um, were able to actually find uh, find jobs through that program, right? Yes, um, I I'm not technical, so I apologize if I say this incorrectly. But it's my understanding that part of like you were saying, this interview process is that a lot of hiring managers look at people's GitHub accounts and the fact that these women now have commits on their GitHub accounts gives them much more credibility than they had before um, and definitely has helped several of them get jobs, which is phenomenal. That's what we want, right? More women in tech. Awesome. Not, not yeah, that we I, don't want all the other wonderful things too, but from my perspective, like I love open source, open source is great, but I am also really, really interested in just changing the ratio and getting more women jobs in tech. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I want to talk more about the apprentices and the people that have been contributing through the program in just a second. But I think one other thing that I want to point to here, um, and I don't necessarily have a firsthand understanding of this, but I've worked with companies and heard conversations that uh, when companies are looking to invest money, so we've talked about investing um, support, but if companies want to invest money, I think one thing that people need to 
be mindful of on these projects is sometimes the ways that companies spend money are weird. And I've heard that it's like sometimes very difficult for companies to like say donate like $50. It's much easier for them to buy a license for $5,000 than it is to do like a, a nebulous $50 donation. So, you know, you could consider if you're an open source project and you're looking to solicit a support to make it easier for corporations to do so, which would mean going through maybe more standard providers rather than just like a Venmo link, right? Companies are gonna have trouble paying to a Venmo link, but they might have a lot easier time paying through the, the GitHub version of Payne or Open Collective or any of these other more standardized payment methods. And additionally, you might consider whether or not to like sell a support slot. Um, I'm not sure, Moshe, you can tell me what your thoughts are on this because again, I've only heard this nebulously, but you could consider whether to just set a donation price for a company for a sponsorship spot. Some companies do like gold, silver, bronze tiers for their projects, but sometimes just putting a number, even though the number doesn't necessarily mean anything, it's just so much easier for purchasing managers and people at companies to just say, here, run an invoice for this amount, through this generalized payment method, and it just processes so much more quickly than trying to, I think we should donate 50 bucks here, and how do we do that? So I don't know, Moshe, your thoughts on that, if you've had any experience doing that with these companies. You know, we, we had experience, I mean, you know, from our perspective, when we, uh, when we do this type of sponsorship is open source projects, like, you know, Selenium and Storybook, for example, so uh, we know that many people that are using uh, Again, Selenium, Cypress, Storybook are very likely to enjoy Apply Tools and uh, will get a lot of benefits from using Apply Tools. So we're like sponsoring these projects by, you know, like the donating to the project and getting our logo to be on the, uh, on the project page. Uh, but I think when you think about other companies, which are not necessarily tool vendors like us, but just companies that benefit from these open source projects and want to give back, um, I think I'm, I'm not sure how much it's, it's important for them to have their logo on the project page, but they, I'm pretty sure that they'll be willing to. Uh, uh, you know, to fund the project in one way or another. So I think it's definitely an interesting idea and maybe finding a way with uh, Microsoft or Amazon to allow companies to, um, you know, to fund it through their AWS or through their Azure uh, budget, maybe like an interesting uh, angle that can benefit, uh, can benefit some of these projects and make it easy for them because this is a, kind of like a, an engine that is really easy, easy to spend through. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. And, and it, and what we're not advocating or what I'm not saying is to change the spirit of open source. So I'm not saying, you know, not allow companies to use it unless they pay. I'm just saying that if you're an open source community and you want to make it easy for companies to pay, setting up certain things will make it a lot easier for certain companies to spend. Because like I said, I've had that conversation with companies before where they were like, honestly, it's easier for us to pay $5,000 for a license than it is for us to pay $50 to a person for a donation. Yeah, They're perfect. like, just the way our spending systems are set up, it doesn't work that way. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, as promised, I wanted to go back and talk to the uh, talk about the actual apprentices and the people that are contributing. So, um, we've touched on it a little bit, but uh, Chris, I don't know if you want to give kind of your experience about what it is that you do with this program as a mentor, um, and maybe just tell a little bit of the experiences of the apprentices that you've worked with, like kind of what has been your experience working with them on these open source projects. Absolutely. So the, the way it kind of works for us is we, uh, we work with Apple Tools and we say, you know, we kind of identify some, some open source repos that would be interested in this introduction and, and to help women in tech. So we contact those, uh, the maintainers of those and, and we have the com that initial conversation. Uh, we then put something out and the, these women out of boot camps will apply. They go through a simple code test um, and, and just a general sort of interview process. And then once, once they get through that, then they come to me and we, uh, Eva and I and a couple others go through and, uh, and say, you know, we have a new apprentice and here's this repo that we're going to uh, work with them on. Uh, and then when they get to me, what, what I do is I set up a, an initial meeting, like an onboarding meeting where I introduce myself to them as, as this dot and I introduce this program to them. And we talk about, you know, here, here's what we're trying to do. Here's the end goal of what we're trying to accomplish. Where you know, and and but to me, like the important aspect that I try to promote is why we're doing it, why we're doing it, and what the benefit of it is. Which to me is massive of saying, like, uh, like even mentioned this earlier, but understanding that these kind of contributions, having these on their GitHub, uh, sets them apart, right? Having this on their resume sets them apart, and and it also helps them to grow and understand things that like get kind of 
shoved under the table a little bit when it, when it comes to boot camps. And, and honestly, I came from, I did computer information systems. We never did anything like this. I haven't heard anything like this in CompSci either. And that is learning your tooling and, and understanding where these, these like non-code related things and how they fit into this massive ecosystem of software engineering, um, things like actual Git work. And, and this is changing a little bit, but understanding not just the traditional add, commit, merge commands, but understanding forking understanding how to make contributions open source, how to work with open issues, how to submit a PR with an accurate description, um, how to, uh, and, and really understanding these tools. And, and so we talked a lot initially about um, their tooling, making sure that things are set up correctly, right? Things like if you're gonna use VS Code, for instance, for example, this is how we make sure we set it up correctly, making sure that their terminal, their bashes, their environments are in the right situation to go about it, right? These like non necessarily code related, but still very important to this ecosystem. And what I always tell them is like, these are the things that are going to set you apart because if, if I come to you and I say, um, I, here's the repo, you've been added to it. Here's your first ticket and go. Does that take you five minutes or does that take you five hours? Right. And that's a massive difference. And it's very, very, very important. Um, and, and so we have a, that first conversations around that. Then I schedule another conversation and we, and we go through a little bit of, of test frameworks specifically because of doing Apple tools and understanding where these test frameworks sit in and um, working through um, making sure like, okay, so here's unit tests, here's where the ecosystem, they exist, integration into end, visual regression um, and understanding how to write code that is testable. So we talk about, about you know, functional programming or good programming practices, drive principles, making sure that we have good tests uh, and that we understand tests and the value of tests so we have a lot of conversations around that. And then I introduce that and say, okay, so this is what you're going to do. This is the repo. And we talk about forking it and bringing it onto the machine, running it locally, making sure that we can do those things. Uh, and then I, I sort of set them free, give them some time to just mess around, give it a shot, right? I create their own branch, do their work. And then I meet up with them again and we discuss. Um, so now that you have this work, you have this suite of work, it, it works, it's tested, it's doing the thing that we want. It solves the problem. Then I go through and I do a code review. I have them put up a pull request in their local fork of it. Um, and I talk to them about good commit hygiene, making sure that their commit messages are you know, well-worded and they're appropriate and they really act, you know, are representative of what the work that they did, uh, making sure that they have descriptions that are, I hate to say this, but are descriptive. You know, provide me context. Why did you do this? What were, what were you trying to accomplish and how did you go about accomplishing it? Instead of, I introduced Apple tools. I can see that. Thank you. It's why did I introduce it? What is the value of this? Um, really trying to help them and see these things that are going to set them apart of you can be a good coder, but you also need to be somebody who is good to work with and good to, to be mentored and be trained and, and to go forward in these things that are also on the side, but very, in my opinion and the opinion of what we look for, very important. Um, and so that, that's been a lot of good conversations. So I give them a code review uh, and we do some pair pro, like, call them and we go through the code review steps and then we talk about how to get it into the re the uh, upsource, like the main repo, the actual repository um, and copy the description over. And then it, it gets, you know, it, it, that's the part where it's kind of off of us. It's kind of off of them. Um, and it's, that's the real open source part of it, um, which is working with maintainers to merge code. Um, and for good or bad, you know, there's moments of that that can be very frustrating. Um, but there's moments where they can be very beautiful too. And they can see like, this is how these things grow. This is the things that they're looking for. And it's a good opportunity for these, you know, for these women, for these engineers to, uh, to see that and to see that process too, right? It's not always going to be cut and dry. It's not always going to be working with one person like me to come in and say, this is what you did. This is what I asked for. It is done. I agree with it merged and let's go, right? That's not always going to be the case. So it's, it's been a learning experience on, on our end as well as theirs to understand, but it has set them apart. Um, so now they have this on their resume, they have this and they have the skill set. you know, they, they understand these things and it really helps them to grow. And so that's been amazing to see. Um, and it's been, I have a lot of really good conversations with them to see where they're at, very diverse, complex backgrounds um, of what decide, you know, what was their crux of getting into coding and, and how they can fit and where they want to go from here. Uh, so it's been a really amazing program. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite aspects of the job of getting to do it is helping to change the ratio, helping to promote these women and, and talk about the non tangible, just coding related things about being an engineer is honestly the most important aspect of it.
Awesome. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, one thing that is interesting is the divergence in opinions on whether or not open source is a friendly environment for junior developers, right? Um, I've heard people suggest contributing to open source as a great thing for junior developers to do. Our boss, Tracy Lee, she believes in this extensively. She loves to contribute to open source in whatever way that she can and has thought that it has made a big difference in her career. Definitely advocates that people do that. But some people feel intimidated, either that they have nothing to add or that the community is, um, can be dismissive, dismissive of issues that are raised or of PRs, especially if the PRs aren't up to snuff, that the code reviews might be at times um, dismissive or you know, things like that. I guess I'm, the question I wanna ask is twofold. One, despite those things, is open store, do you believe that open source is a valuable thing that people that are junior developers should be looking to contribute to, to improve their skills and their status in the, in the industry? And then secondarily, what are some of the things that you've seen that these open source projects should be doing to be more receptive to, to be more inviting to um, junior developers and, and being clear in ways that junior developers could contribute to their code? Okay. Yeah, uh, that, that is something we've definitely been struggling with. Uh, I'll touch on this and then Masha, you, you can have, you have it. But um, that, that is something that we struggle with um, in a lot of ways because, um, well, GitHub did some research of Created, they had they gra grabbed a subset of women and they had them create PRs on accounts that were very gender identifying, that went specifically female identifying. And, and the number of those PRs that were merged was abysmal, um, very, very low compared to the same people doing PRs with GitHub accounts that were very gender neutral or non-gender identifying. Uh, same PRs, same work, those got merged. The ones with female identifying did not. Um, so I think that like, you know, as open source maintainers, that's something to be cognizant of uh, is that, you know, bias and, and those kind of things and helping to remove that block. Uh, it's a, this is a much bigger, you know, difficult conversation, but that is something that we see as well um, and that we are working with as well. And that's why we try to approach it from a, you know, helping women in tech conversation, but you know, it's, it's a much larger conversation, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that um, identifying issues that are available for like we you can provide value at this even if you're a junior engineer kind of things it can be very helpful i've seen a lot of times where it's a label of like beginner friendly you know these issues are beginner friendly um th those kind of things and also again clearly defined definitions of done on these tickets good descriptions are also good ways to do it and then you know being open-minded of just looking at the code and not looking at the developer uh, and that's a hard conversation to have but it's true yeah, for sure. And, and I think, I mean, first uh, about the first point you mentioned about like how helpful is it to, for junior developers to contribute to open source. I think this is like a, a very smart strategy if you're a junior developer to go and, uh, you know, find some open source projects which are in areas that you're like um, excited about or passionate about and, uh, and contribute to that. I think it's, it's a great way to learn, not just again, the, the entire ecosystem and all the tooling and everything that you'll probably be using in every, um, every future job. Uh, it's not always easy to kind of like to get in or to start, but I, I think uh, more and more projects are making it easier. And, um, uh, and yeah, actually, Chris, what you shared is actually interesting. I mean, I was not aware of that, but um, I think I'm actually seeing few projects that are really um, proactively encouraging uh, uh, women to get involved and even preferring uh, or trying to prefer um, contributions from, um, uh, from, from females. So I think it's, um, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that this uh, situation exists. And I think we definitely, like anything we can do to change this ratio would be, would be good. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, changes, change, changes occurring. Um, we just keep, keep need to pushing it, uh, keep needing to push it and to grow it more. Uh, but, it, but it has been fun, to, uh, great to see. Great, yeah. And, you know, one story that I love to tell is we had one of our apprentices, Marion, uh, <laughs> who um, came along and she contributed to the NGRX project. And, uh, you know, she enjoyed her experience doing that. And then lo and behold, here comes NGConf, right? The flagship Angular conference. And up comes a slide in the presentation of Brandon Roberts, who's one of the maintainers of NGRX. And there Marion's name was on the list of people that had contributed. And I mean, this is somebody just trying to break into the industry one of her first contributions to the community. And it's celebrated at one of the biggest stages. And then later at a conference, a couple months later, she was able to meet him in person and they got to 
talk and celebrate that contribution. I mean, it's such an amazing story of the power of a single contribution um, and a testament to having programs like this, Eva, and a testament to having companies like Apple Tools, Moshe, that are willing to combine together to make connections like that happen. So yes, she did it as part of this program, but honestly, if you're a junior developer, you're breaking into industry, don't be intimidated. Please reach out to people like Chris or other people that are like him in the industry that would be willing to do this with you and help you through this process um, and make these connections. Don't be scared. Um, it can be intimidating at first, but you can work through it. So I don't know if Eva, if you wanted to, if there was anything else that you wanted to say about um, any other success stories or, or just a kudos as well to Marion for that. But, um, you know, there's just been some really cool stories on working on this that have come out of this program. I think I love that story. It makes me really happy every time I think about it. Um, but also, I just love to point out too that um, the amount of positive energy that these women bring to this is just really fantastic. Um, I love their positivity and their energy. Um, it just, it's nice to talk to them. I mean, I'm, I'm not technical, so I don't do the technical side of them, but I work with them. I check in with them every week. I talk to them. I see how they're doing. I make sure that everything's going on track and just, they're just so excited. And I, I just, I love that positivity. It's really fantastic. And it really speaks to the value of making communities uh, because we have yes. this channel for people that have participated, either are actively participating or have participated in the program, uh, like a Slack channel. And the amount of support that everybody gives each other when their PRs are first submitted or when their PRs are approved, um, it's awesome. It's just a giant celebration in there all the time. Uh, and, and it just really shows the value of finding community in this industry because it can be hard to break into. Um, but if you can find people that are as excited for you to succeed as you are and people that when they succeed, you can be as excited for them as you are for yourself. Um, that is a, a powerful force in any industry at any time, um, and particularly in ours. So, well, great. So that is bringing us pretty close to the end of our conversation. So um, usually when we get here, we give people a chance to just sort of close by saying anything it is that they wanted to say. I kind of just did that twice. So I'm going to call that mine. <laughs> I'll let you guys go. Um, Moshe, I'm going to let you go first. And because one of the things that we did not talk about uh, is actually what you all offer to open source uh, communities and open source libraries. So if you could start your conclusion by just saying if there are open source libraries that are like, this Apple Tools thing sounds kind of interesting, but isn't that a company? So do I have to pay for it and all that kind of stuff? If you could explain briefly what you offer to open source uh, communities, and then if you have any closing thoughts beyond that, please feel free. Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, so what we're offering for open source projects is free access to Apple Tools to use it to test their own um, uh, you know, the, the project itself. Uh, and pretty much encourage every open source project which have like um, uh, some user interface and can benefit from using our technology. I mean, just you know, reach out and we'll be happy to work with you. And if the apprentice uh, program can be beneficial, that's kind of like another uh, another win uh, that, that we can do. Uh, but yeah, I think that's pretty much like as a closing point. I mean, our vision is just to get everyone to do be doing visual testing, to leveraging visual testing as part of their pipeline. So you know, the more open source and commercial and any type of project uh, will be doing it and it just gets us closer to that uh, to that target so yeah that's it awesome thanks how about eva what are your final thoughts on this any last uh, uh pitches or thoughts about about this topic no just it's it's one of the things that i really enjoy about my job um i love being able to give back i love being able to help out other women i've definitely had lots of help from women on my journey and my career. And I really, really enjoy being able to pay that back. It makes me happy. So I'm so glad that we're able to do this. All right. And uh, Chris, any last thoughts uh, about the program, about uh, contributing to open source? Any last uh, plugs or pitches that you want to make? Uh, I, I'd just like to say that, I, you know, seconded, uh, I think that this is a continuing conversation we have to have um, of helping change the ratio and doing what we can. And that's my, it's such a great thing for me. It's, it's such a huge reason I joined this dot and did do these things. Um, and please feel free to reach out, Twitter, whatever. But, you know, we really appreciate Masha and what Apple Tools is doing to help us as well. And, and you know, contribute to open source, see the power, right? Like if you're using it, if you're in there, if you're using open source, give back. You know, it's, it's too important. It's what we do. It's what we build off of. Um, so it's been awesome and I really enjoy it. So, yeah. Hey, Rob, can I just say one more quick thing too? Um, 
I work a lot in, in this apprentice program and talking to companies and trying to get them to support open source and women and Apple tools is the one company who has consistently put their money where their mouth is. And a lot of people out there are willing to talk about it, but they're not willing to make those next steps to do anything about it. So I just want to give a shout out to Moshe and Apple tools for actually doing that. It's awesome. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, on, on this bed of, of, of great feelings, uh, we will wrap up today's conversation about investing in open source. I just want to thank everybody for uh, listening to this podcast. I want to thank, of course, the guests for being here. Now, one of the things that we like to say is that the conversation does not stop here. So if you have any additional questions or you know, things that you want to talk about, you can reach all of us online. Um, especially on Twitter. So you can find Moshe on Twitter at uh, Moshe Milman. That's M-O-S-H-E-M-I-L-M-A-N. You can find Eva online at Eva Howe. That's E-V-A-H-O-W-E. And Chris, he's the, he's the one, the outlier here. He's got a slightly different handle. So you can find Chris online at C-M Whited. So that's C-M-W-H-I-T-E-D. And me, you can find me online at RoboCell. So it's R-O-B-O-C-E-L-L. As for the podcast, you can find us online at moderndotweb.com or on Twitter at modernweb. So thank you again, everybody, for listening, and we hope to see you on the next one. See you later. Bye-bye.